This is the second part of our chapter on water. Um, we're going to look at this idea that the availability of water is really unpredictable. And as a result, humans being creative have come up with a number of ways to control the availability and alter the availability of water. So we're going to look at some of those ways and the consequences. First thing I want to talk about um, are levees and an enlarged bank built up on each side of a river to control flooding, keep the water in the river, um, especially when we're dealing in places with seasonal flooding. This is a common practice. Um, used to be that we wanted to plant crops uh, primarily along waterways because well sediment and nutrients being carried downstream would occasionally flood the land surrounding it and make for very fertile soil. Um, seems more these days we're interested in development along rivers so uh, we do we use levees to prevent that seasonal flooding and occasional flooding. Um, some issues with levees though are that natural flood waters no longer add fertility to the surrounding soil. Um, also, sediments don't leave the river, so they're carried further downstream to settle out where the river meets the ocean. Um, and as much as yeah, this, this can prevent flooding in one location, it can cause even worse flooding downstream as more water is carried down that normally would have flooded a greater area of land. Um, and another thought is that it does encourage development in floodplains, and levees don't always hold. Sometimes they still break, even in areas where there's development. So there's some question on whether or not um, people should be developing in those areas at all. Um, this image is a levee um, that's just outside of St. Louis, Missouri, that collapsed in 2008, allowing floodwaters to spread into the surrounding fields. Um, similar to levees are dikes. Uh, the only difference really is that a dike is built to prevent ocean waters from flooding adjacent lands instead of rivers. dam. Now that I have your attention, um, a dam is basically, it's just, uh, it's a barrier running across the river um, or a stream to control the flow of water. And another term to be familiar with before we talk about why we use dams uh, would be a reservoir. The reservoir is the area uh, behind the dam where the water is stored. And Lake Wiley here where we live is a reservoir. So why do we use dams? Um, a lot of people think it's primarily for hydroelectric um, energy. And this isn't the case. Actually, only about 3% of the dams in the U.S. are for hydroelectric energy. But uh, that is definitely one of the reasons. Um, the other reason, about 18% of them are built for flood control in the U.S. And another 40 or so percent are built um, to create lakes for recreation. With this one here in this picture, this is the world's largest dam. It's uh, the Three Gorges Dam on the Yangtze River in China. It does all three of those things. It makes a large amount of electricity. Um, it does a great job reducing flooding that used to plague cities downstream from it for centuries. Um, but the reservoir above it that was created uh, actually flooded 13 cities and close to 1,500 towns and villages. Um, that's going to cause the dislocation of a lot of people and the relocation of a lot of people, um, as well as altering the habitat that, uh, that now floods. Um, in a few cases uh, that I read about, we've even got some dams that have been created to make scenic lakes for housing developments. But uh, primarily it's hydroelectric power, flood control, and recreation that we use dams for. Now in addition to altering some habitat, um, one concern with dams is that they do disrupt the natural, natural flow of water, and in doing that, they also block the migration of some fish that need to move upstream, um, like salmon that move upstream to breed. Uh, so we've compensated for this um, by putting in fish ladders, and this, here, uh, this picture is of a fish ladder, so that fish can basically swim up this series of stairs that were put in to get past the dam and continue upstream to their traditional routes. Um, and it's not just about the salmon. If you think about that, there's a rippling effect throughout the rest of the food web. Um, think of bears that feed on salmon. If the salmon can't get upstream, uh, there's no food for the bears as well. And that continues on through that food web. So fish ladders, one way to help fish continue around dams. <laughs> 
Let's look at uh, this picture here. Another way that humans alter the availability of water is, well, just basically pulling it off of a river and channeling it somewhere else. Um, and that's done most frequently by an aqueduct, um, a canal or a ditch that's used to carry water from one location to another. Um, it's really an expensive practice to do this. It fragments habitat. It decreases um, the volume of water flowing downstream to, um, to other locations. Um, in fact, even so much, this is one, uh, the one in this picture rather, is the Colorado River Aqueduct. It diverts water from the Colorado River to Los Angeles through the Mojave Desert. Um, and so much water is diverted out of the Colorado River that it frequently runs dry before reaching the ocean. One uh, big example, um, and probably the most infamous example, of the consequences of water diversion uh, happened starting in the 1950s when uh, the area that was then the Soviet Union um, decided to divert water from two rivers that fed into the Aral Sea. That area is now on the border of uh, what is now Kazakhstan and Uzbekistan. And there's a number of consequences to this. One, uh, the Aral Sea used to be the fourth largest lake in the world um, in terms of surface area, but it's decreased by about 60% from 1960 through 2002. Um, also, a few other consequences that may not come to mind other than the reduction of that volume of water. As fresh water that was flowing into the, to the Aral Sea um, was diverted, less fresh water is getting into the Aral Sea. So this is going to increase the salinity of the sea and that devastating effects by destroying local fish populations. Another thing to uh, think about here is as the lake beds were dried up, dust storms started eroding them. So you had salts and pesticide residues entering the atmosphere. Um, and another consideration with this too is that we've talked about how one of the great properties of water is that it cools slowly and heats slowly. So it has this climate regulating effect. Cities that are located on large bodies of water typically have less extreme winters and less extreme summers. So the diversion of water from the Aral Sea has actually had climate changing effect. Um, that region now experiences hotter summers and colder winters. We've also talked about how little fresh water is available, um, but we have a lot of salt water available on the planet. And especially in water poor countries, areas in the Middle East, it's quite common to desalinate water. Um, so the process of removing salt from water is called desalination. I've seen it written as desalinization before. Um, but the, I, there's a couple of common ways that this is done, and probably the simplest and oldest method is to essentially distill that water or um, boil it, collect the water vapor, and leave the salts behind. So this is done. Um, water is drawn into um, the boiling chamber, and it's drawn in very slowly. You want to draw in the water slowly so that you're not pulling fish in. And that water is going to pass through um, a series of filters to remove solids before it gets the condensing coil. So as it enters the boiling chamber, it gets the condensing coil, and the ocean water is going to serve two purposes. Um, I'll get to the second one in just a second. I mean, the first purpose, obviously, is it provides the water that we're going to remove the salt from. Um, so we get the water down here. Uh, we boil it. This takes a lot of energy, so it's going to be also an expensive process. Uh, but by boiling that water, we create steam. Steam rises. The cool water that's coming in through that condensing coil um, actually helps to well, cool the steam and condense it back into drops of water. But when you boil the water and create the steam, it leaves the salt behind. So what's collecting on the other side of this barrier is just fresh water, which exits over here at point four. Um, the water that's left behind with the salt in it is going to be more concentrated um, in terms of its salt concentration because, well, there's less water content. And we call that, um, that very salty water brine and then we that exits through the another way that we can get take uh, salt water rather and turn it into fresh water um, and, and remove the salt is a process called reverse osmosis so once again at point one uh, before we get to point one rather the water is pulled in very very slowly we don't want to pull in fish um, it passes through a whole series of filters to remove things like seaweed and other particulate matter um, so that when we get 
2.1, we have nothing but salt water. And you may remember from biology, uh, and may have done some labs, hopefully you did some labs uh, for osmosis where water would move through a semi-permeable membrane. Uh, in the case of osmosis, though, the water would want to move in this diagram from right to left. Uh, with reverse osmosis, we use pressure at point two to move the water in the opposite direction. And by applying tremendous amounts of pressure, um, we can force the water back across that semi-permeable membrane to the right, leaving the salt behind. Water molecules are small enough to move through the semi-permeable membrane. Salt's not. Uh, so the salt stays behind. So again, you're going to have a more concentrated salt water left behind on the left side. Uh, and that brine, as we called it before, is going to exit here at point five. This is our water that's going to be returned to the ocean in most cases. Um, over on the right side, you're left with nothing but fresh water. And that will exit as usable water for people at point four. So that's how humans alter the availability of water. Thanks for watching, and as always, uh, be sure to ask questions in class.